So let's say we have a chemical reaction where we form a bond and break a bond. These electrons fall on this guy forming these products. Then once we form these products, we reattack forming a bond, breaking a bond, these electrons fall on this carbon, reforming these reactants, then we reform the products and etc. So eventually this chemical reaction will reach an equilibrium. So once this chemical reaction has reached equilibrium, will the vast majority of the molecules be in the form of these reactants or will the vast majority of the molecules be in the form of these products? Well, to determine this, we need to analyze the stability of these conjugate bases. And by knowing and, and quantifying the stability of these conjugate bases, we can determine whether this reaction at equilibrium will be mostly products or reactants. So I'll let you know right now, chloride is much more stable than this carbon anion. So because this chloride is much more stable, these products are more stable. So because these products are more stable, that tells us once this reaction reaches equilibrium, the vast majority will be in the form of these products because these products are more stable. But how do we prove that? How do we quantify exactly how much more stable chloride is than this carbon anion? Well, the way we do this is first, let, let's, let's, do, let's quantify how stable this chloride is. So in order to do that, we know we have the, these chemical reactions where it attacks and then this bond breaks and, and, and we have these, these kind of R groups, these, these carbon groups. But instead of dealing with these complex R groups, let's just simplify it. So instead of dealing with these carbon R groups, instead Let's just imagine it's a simple hydrogen, because it's the same idea. Thermodynamically, it's the same thing. Whether we're dealing with these carbon groups where we attack, forming a bond, breaking a bond, forming these products, then we attack, forming a bond, breaking a bond, forming these reactants, it's the same thing whether it's a carbon group or if it's a hydrogen. If it's a hydrogen, it's the exact same idea. It's the exact same idea, and thermodynamically, it's the same thing, forming these same conjugate bases. And, and so, so therefore, to simplify it, we can just imagine these are hydrogens rather than carbons. But why? Why, instead of dealing with these carbons, why deal with hydrogens? Well, now we're dealing with hydrochloric acid, which we know we can find information about hydrochloric acid. For example, we can find the Ka on hydrochloric acid, and it's easier to deal with this hydrochloric acid. So, so what do I mean? So let's, let's do an example. So again, really, we, we were dealing with these molecules, but to simplify it, instead of a carbon group, we're dealing with a hydrogen, and, and we'll explain why. So we don't know a lot of information about this guy, but we can figure out information about hydrochloric acid. It's a little easier to deal with. For example, we know hydrochloric acid reacts with water, and then it protonates water, forming this chloride conjugate base and this hydronium. And then the hydronium will reprotonate, reforming these reactants, then will reform the products, and eventually this reaction will reach equilibrium. So once this reaction reaches equilibrium, will the vast majority of the molecules be in the form of these products, or will the vast majority of the molecules be in the form of these reactants? Well, we can determine that using the Ka of hydrochloric acid. And we can easily look in a textbook, a chemistry textbook, and determine what the Ka is of hydrochloric acid. It's not easy to find the equilibrium constant of this reaction, uh, of this guy, when it, when it reacts. However, using hydrochloric acid is very convenient because we can easily, in a textbook, find the Ka of hydrochloric acid. And we know the way this Ka equation works. We essentially let this reaction react. We let it reach equilibrium. Then we take those concentrations at equilibrium, plug them into this equation, and that tells us the Ka. And again, we learned about this in the previous video. I have a link of that video below because we're going to build upon those ideas, and then this is review. But again, so we know we let this reaction react. We let it reach equilibrium. We take those concentrations once we've reached equilibrium, plug them into this equation, and that will give us the Ka. And we know we can look in a textbook that the Ka of hydrochloric acid is 1 times 10 to the 7. So what does that tell us? What does that mean? Well, that means when this reaction reacts, it will eventually reach equilibrium. And if you were to take those concentrations once this reaction reaches equilibrium and plug them into this equation, it would equal this ratio, which is, again, equals our Ka. So the ratio tells us that once this reaction reaches equilibrium, the vast majority of the molecules are in the form of the products, and very little reactants are formed. So at equilibrium, we have this ratio where nearly all the molecules are in the form of this product, these products. So what does that mean? Well, that tells us that chloride, this, this chloride, this conjugate base, must be very stable. And that's why when this reaction reaches equilibrium, the vast majority of the molecules are in the form of these products because chloride is so stable. It's so stable that once this reaction reaches equilibrium, the vast majority of the molecules are in the form of this chloride and products.
So now we know, now we know we, we were able to, in a sense, quantify and prove that chloride is very stable. This is a very stable conjugate base using this Ka of hydrochloric acid. But sometimes instead of dealing with Ka's, we like to deal with these pKa's. And we know if we know the Ka of hydrochloric acid, we can plug it into this equation to find the pKa of hydrochloric acid. So we would find that the pKa of hydrochloric acid is negative 7. But it tells us the exact same thing. If hydro, the, the pKa... The, Hydrochloric acid having a pK of negative 7 essentially tells us that it's a strong acid and at equilibrium the vast majority of the molecules are in the form of these products in the chloride. So it tells us this pK of hydrochloric acid being negative 7 tells us that this chloride is very stable. And if you're dealing with this molecule with this R group, it would be hard to quantify how stable chloride is. But using hydrochloric acid, we were able to very easily quantify and prove that this chloride is very stable. So now let's do the same thing for this carbon anion. Let, let, let's, let's quantify how stable this carbon anion is. So again, rather than dealing with this group, with this R group, it's hard to find out information about this R group. However, we can easily deal with this acid. And again, we know dealing with this acid, we can find the Ka of this particular acid. So we know it protonates water forming these products, then it reprotonates reforming the reactants. We know this reaction will reach equilibrium. So when this reaction reaches equilibrium, will the vast majority of the molecules be in the form of these products or in the form of these reactants? Well, again, we can easily find the Ka of this acid. We can look in any textbook and find this particular acid and find what the Ka is. And the Ka happens to be around 6 times 10 to negative 10. So what does that mean if this acid has a Ka of 6 times 10 to negative 10? That means when this reaction reacts, it reaches equilibrium. Once it reaches equilibrium, we take those concentrations, once it reaches equilibrium, plug them into this equation, and it'll give us a ratio of roughly this value, which is roughly around 6 times 10 to negative 10. But this gives us the general ratio. And essentially what this means is at equilibrium, the vast majority of the molecules are in the form of the reactants, and very little are in the form of these products. And that's what this Ka tells us. The Ka tells us the ratio of reactants to products at equilibrium. It tells us at equilibrium how many products relative to reactants. So we see, based on the Ka, that the vast majority of the molecules are in the form of reactants. So the point is, this dealing with this molecule is difficult, but dealing with this molecule is easy. We can find the Ka of this molecule, which tells us essentially how many molecules at equilibrium are in the form of reactants relative to products, and we see that nearly all the molecules are in the form of the reactants. So therefore, very little molecules are in the form of these products. Why at equilibrium is the ratio tell us that the vast majority of the molecules are in the form of reactants re re rather than products? Well, it's because these products are very unstable, and therefore this, this, this carbon ion and conjugate base is very unstable. That's why at equilibrium nearly all the molecules are in the form of these reactants, because this, this conjugate base is very unstable. So that's what the Ka of this acid tells us. Using, using this acid and using the Ka of this acid, it essentially tells us the stability of this conjugate base. So now we know this conjugate base is not very stable, based, based on the Ka of this acid and, and where the equilibrium lies. And again, sometimes instead of dealing with Ka's, we like to deal with pKa's, and we explain how we go from Ka to pKa. But now we know this acid has a pKa of 9.2. And essentially what that tells us is it tells us that at equilibrium, the vast majority of the molecules are in the form of these reactants, and there's very little products made at equilibrium. So therefore, these products aren't stable. So therefore, this carbon anion, anion in this conjugate base is not stable. So now we know this guy is not stable. And we were able to do that using the, the pKa of this acid. And again, if we were just dealing with this molecule, it would be hard to quantify the stability of, of this conjugate base. But dealing with the acid, we can simply deal with Ka's and pKa's and determine how stable this conjugate bases. So now, again, remember, in reality, we're dealing with these molecules, but using these acids as a proxy, we were able to determine these pKa's, which tell us about the stability of these conjugate bases. This pKa being negative 7 tells us that this is a very stable conjugate base. This pKa being 9.2 tells us that this conjugate base is very unstable. So now we know this guy's stable, this guy's unstable, so therefore it makes sense that this, when this reaction reaches equilibrium, the vast majority of the molecules will be in the form of these products because these products are more stable. And again, it's true whether we're dealing with whether this is a hydrogen or if it's this carbon group. It doesn't make a difference because again, 
whether if it's if it's a hydrogen, it's the same idea. This guy takes the hydrogen and then we form this conjugate base, and we're wondering how stable this conjugate base is. So whether it's a hydrogen doing that or if it was, if it was this R group, it's the same thing. It will still attack. It will still form this conjugate base, and we're just interested in the stability of the conjugate base. So it doesn't matter if we're dealing with an R group or a hydrogen. It's it's the same idea. The stability of these conjugate bases are the same, and we can quantify the stability of these conjugate bases using the acid rather than using it with this R group. So now we know. So now we know this guy's much more stable than this guy, so at equilibrium, the vast majority of the molecules would be in the form of the products. But again, how exactly do we quantify? How do we quantify exactly how many products there'll be relative to reactants? How, how can we quantify that? Well, again, we know. We learned in the previous video. And again, if you, you, you look at the left side and you find the acid on the left side, then you find the pKa of the acid on the left side, then you find the acid on the right side, you find the pKa of the acid on the right side, and you use this equation, this simple equation, where you take the pKa of the acid on the left and subtract it by the pKa of the acid on the right, and that will give you the pKa of the reaction. So again, it's a very straightforward reaction. And again, remember, in reality, we're dealing with these, these, these R groups, but again, Rather, we're dealing with an R group, which is a hydrogen. It's thermodynamically, it's the same thing. So, so for simplicity, we're just dealing with these these acids. So again, as long as we know the pKa of both the acids, we can use the pKa of those acids to find out the pKa of the of the overall reaction. As long as we take the pKa of the acid on the left and subtract it by the pKa of the acid on the right. So again, if we were to do that, we would have negative seven subtracted by. 9.2. And if we were to do that, we were to find the pKa of this reaction. So we would see this reaction has a pKa of negative 16.2. So now we know this reaction, whether we're dealing with these acids or with this, all these R groups, it will have a pKa of around negative 16.2. But rather than dealing with the pKa's, sometimes we like to deal with the Ka's. So if you have the pKa, you simply plug it into this equation to get the Ka. So we would see this reaction has a Ka of roughly 1.5 times 10 to the 16. So now we know this reaction whether we're dealing with the acids or the R groups, this reaction has a Ka of 1.5 times 10 to 16. So what does this mean and what does this tell us? Well, that tells us when this reaction reacts, it reaches equilibrium. So again, this reaction reacts, it reaches equilibrium. Once it reaches equilibrium, we take those concentrations at equilibrium, plug them into this equation, and they'll equal the Ka, which we know happens to be 1.5 times 10 to 16. So therefore, we know... When this reaction reaches equilibrium, we the ratio of products to reactants would equal this, this Ka value. So we see this ratio at equilibrium. So this tells us that once this reaction reaches equilibrium, the vast majority of the molecules will be in the form of the products relative to reactants. That's what the Ka tells us. Remember, the Ka tells us the ratio of products relative to reactants at equilibrium. So we see, based on this ratio, that once this reaction reaches equilibrium, the vast majority of the molecules will be in the form of these products. So now we've done it. We've quantified and, and proved that once this reaction reaches equilibrium, the vast majority of the molecules will be in the form of these products, and very little reactants will be made. The, the ratio of products to reactants will heavily favor the products. So, so now we were, we were able to quantify this. So now we know when this reaction reaches equilibrium, it will strongly lie towards these products. So again, rather than dealing with these R groups, we were able to deal with these acids, so we were able to quantify some of these values to determine the stabilities and therefore when this reaction reaches equilibrium. So now we know, and again, whether we were dealing with these acids or if we were dealing with these R groups, it's the same idea. These conjugate bases have the same stability, so, so we would still have these same kind of pKa values that we could use. We could do the pKa of the left, subtracted by the pKa of the right to find the pKa of the reaction. Then once we find the pKa of the reaction, now we have the Ka of the reaction. And the Ka of the reaction tells us that this reaction heavily favors the products at equilibrium. So 